It's a pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Global Institute for Water Security and Global Water Futures Programs uh, who underwrite this, this series. I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, a couple of reminders. One, that uh, next week's talk is by Stefan Krauss from University of Birmingham in the UK. And uh, we'll continue for the next uh, few weeks before we break at the end of term. I also want to acknowledge before we start that we are on Treaty 6 territory, homeland of the Métis, and we pay our respect to these First Nations and Métis communities and ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. Uh, it's a real delight to introduce today's speaker, Marcus Weiler. Uh, Marcus is Professor and Chair of Hydrology at Freiburg University in Germany, where he's also the Director of the Center for Water Research. He has many other administrative titles, but I think it's it's important to note uh, really that Freiburg for me is the center of hydrological teaching in Europe uh, with a unique focus on blending field work and modeling. And Marcus is really the, the, the intellectual head of that whole endeavor. Uh, Marcus got his PhD in 2001 from the ETH Zurich. And uh, whenever I reflect back on those days, I think of the Joan Baez song, Diamonds and Rust where she talks about uh, you burst on the scene already a legend. This was certainly the case in Marcus's uh, situation. He came and did a postdoc with me for two years at Oregon State University, and it was more me doing a postdoc with Marcus than uh, the other way around. He then went on to become the FRBC chair in forest hydrology at UBC in Vancouver, where he was for six years prior to uh, his return to Germany in his current position. Uh, Marcus has really become the thought leader in hill slope and catchment hydrology. He's president of the German Hydrological Society. He's an editor at HESS, Hydrology and Earth System Science, the EGU journal, and he's associate editor of the Beto Zone uh, journal. And uh, really, the, the only area where I can come close to competing with Marcus now is on the tennis court. And perhaps in the Q&A, we could describe our last uh, tennis match and the, the final score of that game. But uh, before I get carried away, I just want to thank Marcus for joining us and turn it over to him for this week's lecture. Thanks for the nice introduction and thanks for inviting me to my office to give this talk to you in Canada. I'm very delighted to do so. Unfortunately, I will probably miss nice beer and nice goodies afterwards, but probably I have to do it myself tonight. Uh, alone. Anyway, I'm happy to be with you and I would like to talk about rainfall, events and floods. And more or less the question I would like to pose to you is which rainfall events produce the largest floods and what, what do we need to consider? Rainfall characteristics, soil moisture, retention, runoff and such much. And the pieces of work I would like to present are certainly, as always, not things I did myself, but has been done by many other scientists. And uh, you see the longer list of uh, people who have really worked hard on that endeavor we are working since a couple of years. The question I would like to ask, heavy precipitation can happen everywhere, but probably the amount and the intensity are different. And when we look, for example, I will mostly show you some data from Germany, but you can certainly uh, transfer some of the ideas also to other countries. When we look at heavy precipitation events, and this is just the number of events uh, above a certain threshold of rainfall intensity in Germany, we see, we see there is a clear pattern throughout the year with those heavy thunderstorms in the summer events producing those short, bursts of precipitation, high intensities, just a couple of uh, minutes, maybe 30 minutes, maybe an hour long. And up to now, we have not really considered such events from the hydrological perspective so well, because most of the time we are just looking for those larger events in the catchments where we have observations. So, but when we look at those events in of heavy precipitation, uh, and we, if you do some statistics on it, we certainly see, uh, for example, here looking at the 60-minute 
duration uh, with a return period of 100 years that we have quite a bit of spatial patterns. We have areas, for example, here in the northern part of Baden-Württemberg, the state I'm living in, compared to the more southern part. And if we compare that over the different uh, durations from five minutes to one day, we obviously the patterns are switching or changing quite a bit. So the strong effect of topography on the lower events, it's more or less gradually diminishing. And we mostly see some regional events where those thunderstorms can build up, where we have uh, lake effects and things like that. When we move to the scale of Germany, uh, again, we can have completely different pictures of those short, heavy precipitation events, looking at the, uh, at the intensity of the rainfall depth for 15 minutes for six hour events, comparing that to more or less the daily or annual precipitation again, where we have those strong effects in terms of topography and those climatic effects. So again, everywhere you, you may live in Germany, but that may also hold uh, certainly for other places, we have that chance that strong precipitation events may happen. So if heavy precipitations occur so infrequent, we looked at 100 years event, when we look in the newspaper, when we look in the media, they happen so often, right? Every then and on, every week, every second week, we have those flash floods that happen somewhere, at least uh, in Central Europe. And you may ask yourself, why is this the case? When those rainfall events are those so rare, why are the the flash, flash floods so frequent. And this can happen due to those three lines you see here. And what I did is a relatively simple assumption. I assume that I really look at very extreme events with a return period of 10,000 years, right? And when we just would look then at the exceedance probability, if we would wait, for example, 50 years, which would be a quite long time, and the probability that such an event would occur within those 50 years, it would be certainly, certainly because the return period is so high, a very, very low probability. But now, if we consider those thunderstorms as individu individually occurring events somewhere, and we consider a certain uh, area for the thunderstorms, I just assume 10 or 100 square kilometer, to develop as a thunderstorm and we have those events. And then if you would just count and, and adding up those probabilities for the state of Baden-Württemberg, which is just 100 by 100 uh, kilometer, uh, for example, for the 10 by 10 square kilometer, we would end up with that red line and for the 100 square kilometer with those yellow lines. So there, if you would then wait 20 years, we would have a probability of 50% that such a very, very extreme event would occur just based on the probability that it just happens somewhere, because those are independent events now within the area of Baden-Württemberg. And this may be the reason if you would plot the 100 year event, it would be uh, very, very, uh, very, very often, happen very, very often. So this is the reason why we often see those flash floods every year again and again, somewhere in a different city, in a different area, uh, in our neighborhood. So those flooding we are considering now, those flash floods, is not really the same as those pluvial floods we often look at. So we really have to dif differentiate between pluvial and fluvial flood and the different processes and the different reason. And all the, the resulting hazards that are generated. So we can relatively simply consider more like those two events, the typical fluvial floods that just happen by flooding from a big river that usually happens over a long, a long period of time. We have a relatively good possibility for forecasting because we have the flood wave moving down the river. The headaches you have is with those small, events, those uh, thunderstorms that produce those pluvial floods that are very local and that actually happen 
very frequently in areas where we don't have even any river, right? Where we only have a very small creek and people are not aware at all that flooding may be a problem. And when we, for example, look at uh, the areas that I've been, uh, that are being analyzed for this charge record and where we have uh, in Germany those called uh, flood maps, uh, and compare them to the blue line. So that you see here the area around Freiburg where I'm living, and you can see all the blue lines in the map from all the rivers we have. So the thick lines you see here are the rivers we run our flood forecast for. We have uh, flooding maps, but we do not have any information about probability of flash floods in all those smaller creeks you see here, and you see the length of those creeks is quite a lot. And there are a lot of cities, a lot of uh, areas located close by. And this is the reason why we started working more on those flash floods in those smaller catchments, in those smaller areas, because we have a very high risk of events somewhere and we have no uh, possibility of forecasting because just the time for forecasting is just much too short, right? There's a thunderstorm developing, we may see something uh, in the radar pictures and then it's already happened. But not all heavy precipitation events result in flash flood. So we did some kind of analysis where we mapped all the flash floods that occurred in the state of Baden-Württemberg over a period from 2005 to 2018. And we recorded close to 270 flash flood events. Uh, most of them also uh, produced some damages. And you see over here those maps or those events are distributed all over, right? There is not a clear picture of some areas where those events may have happened more often or not so often. But on the other side, if we use precipitation information and radar information, we can just count and see how often does, uh, how often is a certain rainfall intensity exceeded. And if we do that uh, for, this, for only the period from 2010 to 2018, we find more than 1,000 heavy precipitation events with intensities more than 25 millimeter per hour. So, many, many more than we actually observed flash floods. So it seems that many heavy precipitation events don't produce any floods or any flash floods at all. So the question is, if this is the case, we need to study the effects of land use, rainfall characteristics, initial soil moisture condition, soils, geology, in order to really understand what is going on. And this leads me back to the basics of runoff generation. I may repeat that for many of you, but still uh, would like to talk about it briefly. We have precipitation, and when precipitation hits the surface of the soil, there's a question, will infiltration happen, happening or not? If it's not happening, we have Ottonian oval inflow. If it's happening, water will infiltrate and may retain, retain in the soil. Then we have to ask, will percolation happen? If percolation happen, we may have deep percolation, uh, or uh, if it's happening, uh, if it's not happening because we have the impeding layer, we may have subsurface flow or saturation overland flow, depending on the indication of subsurface flow. And the probability of those, if those process is happening and when, we now certainly depends closely on the initial soil moisture condition. If you have dry or saturated condition, uh, we have different initial condition of those processes, but also are strongly related to rainfall events. But what we are still very poor is going out and making prediction at this location, which of those processes will really dominate uh, the runoff generation. In order to become a little bit better, we started to doing some large scale sprinkling experiment. And what we did is what you see here, uh, making small, a large scale or relatively large scale sprinkling events, area of 200 by 200, uh, sorry, 20 by 20 meter. 
And we measured overland flow, subsurface flow, and did a lot of internal measurement. And uh, we usually were able to do that in a week by going out, setting up our equipment on a field, putting all the sprinklers out, sleeping a night, going up again in the morning, further digging the trench, setting up the, the discharge measurements, uh, starting with the first uh, rainfall event, sleeping again, having a beer, getting up in the next morning, going out, getting the fire truck in order to get more water, sprinkling again, sprinkling again, sprinkling again, measuring the night, the next evening in the pub, getting out again, and finally, in the last morning, setting up, uh, cleaning the site, and leaving the site and going home. So it took us one full week to do a couple of experiments uh, with different intensities and different rainfall duration at each of those sites. So we have a really nice data set uh, that we produced and actually that we just published. So you can also use it for your own analysis. And uh, we did so by finding study sites uh, at uh, 23 study sites in, in Germany, uh, sorry, Germany in Baden-Württemberg on different soils. And we usually try to compare pasture and arable land. And you see here the location of the sites and the related soil textures uh, we have in Baden-Württemberg. Good. So, what did we get? So, as I was mentioning, we were running six experiments, so more or less changing our initial soil moisture condition from relatively dry to wet. And what we are looking here is just the runoff coefficient from 1 to 0 to 100 uh, percent for pasture and arable land. And clearly, a first picture we see is that we have a different that we have different responses usually higher for arable land, lower for pasture. And we also see that the runoff coefficient is increasing for increasing initial condition. We also looked at the subsurface flow, but I don't want to go into detail. So if you analyze the dependence of surface runoff on initial soil moisture condition, for all the events, we see a clear pattern uh, for the 100 year precipitation event under dry condition. For all experiments, we see more or less this response over time. If you have the wet initial condition, we have a higher response. So clearly, there seems to be as whether the initial condition as more runoff we produce. But if you look a little bit closer, is what we see on the right side. And what you see here is always the pair of the experiment, initial dry condition, initial wet condition. And on the y-axis, uh, the runoff coefficient. We see that we have more or less three different groups. So group one, no runoff for dry condition, no runoff for wet condition, right? So we were hammering those sites with twice the 100 year precipitation event for one hour, nothing, right? No runoff at all. Then we had the groups that more or less didn't respond for the first, uh, experiment under dry condition, but then for the second uh, experiment, they showed already quite a bit of runoff of 30 40 percent. And then the third group was soils that already produced quite a bit of runoff 40 60 percent for, uh, for the first experiment and still showed even a higher runoff response 80 percent for the second weather condition, right? But as I'm saying, surprisingly, we had many, many uh, experiments where we could not produce any runoff response, despite we were uh, having only 100 years event and large. What we also looked at is the dependence on soil types. And there we can see a clear, or maybe not so clear, <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, a certain uh, response for the silt, for the loams, and for the clay soils. And on the first glance, we would expect, okay, the clay soils should be worse, right? They are at the lowest permeability, so they should have the highest response. But what is maybe on the first glance surprising is 
If you look for the dry condition for the clay soils, they show the lowest response, followed by the loam and followed by the silt soil. Why is that? The main reason is that we have those shrinking cracks in the clay soil, in particular under dry condition, those shrinking, uh, shrinking cracks have the ability to collect a lot of water, to move it into the, into the soil under those dry conditions. And so those soils under dry condition are able to infiltrate quite a bit of water and hence uh, their runoff response is relatively low compared to the loamy and the silty soil. We see other effects, I have no time to go much in detail. If you want to have a closer look, look at the paper I showed in the beginning. Good, so we learned that not all heavy precipitation events result in flash floods. And it's also clear that we cannot do those experiments everywhere. We have to start coming up with a good model, being able to simulate rainfall characteristics and initial soil moisture condition in order to have a good estimation how those flash flood events are happening. Where do we have areas where are catchment that are very prone for those flash floods and where are maybe catchment that uh, have good buffering capacity. So the proposed framework is the following. We would link, like to link those heavy precipitation events with different rainfall characteristics of duration and amount and the initial soil moisture condition. Because we know initial soil moisture condition plays an important role and we have to deal with those com combined probability. And what we did is we developed a joint probability model of soil moisture and rainfall, or we are just saying that the joint probability of two independent variables, and actually we tested that initial soil moisture and rainfall uh, amount and intensity were independent, can be relatively simply estimated by just multiplying the individual non-exceeding probability in order to get the, uh, the combined probability. For example, as an example, if we want to predict a 100 year event, we need to combine or we, we can combine in a certain combination, for example, a 50, 95 year precipitation event with uh, initial soil moisture condition that had a non exceedance probability of 0 0.95. Right? So this would be those probability curve. And we can do that. There have been those uh, concepts developed relatively strong linking flood volume to flood peak, and we just adopted it linking rainfall characteristics with initial soil moisture condition. Then the second thing we need is a model. And the model we use is the model we call Roger. It stands for runoff generation research model. And this is a model where we try to incorporate as much knowledge as we gained in the last years or have been developed in order to simulate the different runoff generation processes I just introduced with all the important effects of infiltration in the soil matrix, infiltration through earthworm channels, through root channels, infiltration through cracks, in order to be able to have a, a, a good representation of those different infiltration processes. The model can be run on an event scale, but the model is also able to run on a longer temporal scale with a high spatial resolution, uh, where we can also simulate the initial uh, soil moisture condition. And actually, we did this. This is just an example. Uh, we were running the model for the whole state of Baden-Württemberg over a longer period. And we compared, for example, at all those locations, observed time series of soil moisture measurements with our model time series of soil moisture measurement uh, in order to be able to see how well are we able with the different assumptions of local and regionalized uh, climate information, precipitation information as well to predict initial soil moisture condition. And in general, we were very happy with the model. Certainly there are also some areas where the model did not turn out so well, but most of those are happening because of the let's put it like this, that the, the soil map we used and the 
the P2 transfer function we applied in order to predict, for example, field capacity, permanent wilting point, were not adding up to the local observed rate. But uh, the distribution and the probability of non exceedance of soil moisture were perfect. So we used that, and then we were more or less able to apply that model to, a, to any catchments, more or less in baden württemberg I just saw you some example of test catchment uh, close to Freiburg, where we have a high mix of land use. You see here the vinicultural areas, uh, pasture land and the forest land, and a, and a strong mix also in soil conditions. And this would be the result that we have, for example, from the water balance model, where we more or less can predict the initial soil moisture condition for certain non exceedance probabilities, 40, 80, and 95%. Uh, that is plotted here as the uh, water amount that has to be filled until feed capacity is reached. And we see typical patterns that certainly we have the soils closer to the river and the valley that are a little bit wetter, where we need more water uh, until they become saturated uh, in different effects of drying out due to land use, etc. And the two catchments I have selected for you are catchment five and six, just as an example how that com combination will work and look like. Good. What you see here is more or less what we did. And it may take me a second to explain. So as I'm saying, the aim, for example, here was we wanted to predict a 100-year flood event. So we selected different rainfall durations, 15, 30, 60, two hours, and four hours. And we selected different initial soil moisture conditions, 5, 20, 40, 60, 80, and 95% not exceeded. And then, based on that, we then had to just select the, with the, uh, the matching probability or the matching return period for the precipitation event to come up with that 100-year uh, combined probability. And this is, for example, what you see here. So the different lines are representing the different return periods for the rainfall events. And for example, here you see for the 15-minute uh, return period, the rainfall intensity plotted uh, against the rainfall amount, and certainly for the 10-year event, that will then be combined with a relatively wet soil moisture condition. The rainfall intensity as well as the rainfall amount is smaller, and that will increase if you move towards higher return period. That will then hit drier soils, because the combined probability is at the end the same. So we were doing 30 model combinations, combining five duration with six soil moisture conditions. And this is then an example of what we are producing. As I was saying, we were running the model at a five by five min, uh, meter spatial resolution. We have done a, a quite a lot of effort in order to combine geological soil, vegetation, uh, surface ceiling information in order to make those prediction. And this is now an example for those catchment five, the runoff overland flow that is being generated over the whole 15 minutes events. And then you see here under the dry condition compared to the wet condition. For the dry condition, most of the runoff occurs from the uh, urban areas and from the streets. And then for the wetter condition, we see some of the areas now starting to kicking in based on the initial soil moisture condition, based on uh, saturation. If you look then, for example, for the, for the long uh, event, 240 minutes, uh, again, certain events are responding and other do not produce any overland flow, right? Because all the water can infiltrate and we, we have no overland flow production. Bringing all those information together is what you can see here now in that combined figure, where I here plot the rainfall amount and the initial soil moisture conditions. And then each plot, uh, sorry, each point is a realization with the same 
combined with tone period of one hundred year, and the size of the dot and the color represent the total runoff being generated for catchment five on the left, for catchment six on the right. And you see, despite the combination is always the same probability, the runoff we are producing is quite different. We have some events that did not produce a lot of runoff, and we had some events in that respect a little bit more that the wetter events were smaller rainfall amounts that produced the highest runoff response. For this catchment, it looks different, right? Here, more or less, the combination in the middle with some kind of an intermediate initial soil moisture condition produced the highest runoff, and actually the wettest condition did not produce the highest runoff due to that combination of probability and local condition. You can also look at this a little bit from the other side. So here, again, I plot runoff against those rainfall amount. Now the colors would represent the different rainfall durations. And now we can really see which of the rainfall duration produces the largest runoff. And you can clearly see that, uh, for example, in this catchment, the 15 minute duration was not so relevant. The highest total runoff was produced uh, for the 30 minutes, and then for the higher uh, for the higher duration, it was low again. And for all, mostly the wet condition produced the highest runoff. Here for the number six catchment, it's very different. You see that shape, that function linking soil moisture and precipitation looks quite differently. And here we have again the 30 minute duration, but an intermediate soil moisture condition that produced the highest result. And depending where we are, we have completely different uh, response patterns. Some may have the longer precipitation amounts, the two hours and the four hours that produce the highest runoff. And then at the end, we also then have to make the prediction regarding peak runoff. At the moment, we just looked at the total runoff being generated, but now we have to think, how do we get from runoff to flooding? And as many of you know, this is not so simple to do. So at the end, it's a question, we have certain areas where runoff is being generated, and we have to come up with models to make prediction based, for example, on uh, times of uh, accumulation, flow velocity, uh, to, to simulate the hydrograph at a certain location. However, if you do that in terms of, uh, of flooding, it's not, we are not only interested in the hydrograph down here at that location, we are actually interested at the hydrograph at any location in the catchment, and hence the water level response in any location in the catchment, and hence the flooding that may happen in any location of the catchment. So typically what people have been used are hydraulic models and those hydraulic models usually solve the two-dimensional uh, overland flow equations. Uh, this is some simplification of the Salvinar equation. Uh, and they can be used if we have a certain input to generate those uh, flooding maps. And there was a comparison done with 25 hydraulic models in one catchment in Baden-Württemberg and all of them used exactly the same distributed input. Okay? So the difference you see now are the differences from the hydraulic model. So not the difference from the hydrology, just the difference from the hydraulic models. First of all, I'll show you the flooding. And what you see here uh, is in blue, more or less the water table elevation or the maximum water table depth that has been simulated from eight of those models. And you see, it looks quite different, right? So with that model here, you are quite safe. And with this model here, uh, you may be quite in trouble if your house is situated. We also compared for uh, this location here, the runoff or the hydrographs that have been simulated. Again, you see a huge variety, right? Again, it's exactly the same input that has been routed by those hydraulic models. And one model produced a peak runoff of 15 cubic meter per second. 
and there are models that produce the peak one off of one cubic meter per second. Why is this the case? One, assumptions in the models, how to solve more or less uh, the Salvinor equation. Second, assumption of roughness, right? And also included assumption of the spatial, uh, more or less the, the, the information, how well we treat different spatial aspects, right? For example, smaller walls or some smaller steps that we have in the landscape. Good. So we really see roughness is still a big problem. And if you have used those models and if you use those tables, we usually see, oh, grassland or pasture, you can estimate some roughness, but the range is usually huge, right? And depending if you use it, uh, the, the smaller or the larger number, the result may be dramatically different. So we also try to write, in addition to what has been done, using those sprinkling experiments and using more or less the recession of the whole sprinkling experiments to derive those rough, uh, to derive further roughness estimates, uh, just to see how well we or how we could use those sprinkling experiments for other questions. And for example, here we use them for estimating roughness of overland flow, but really looking at that larger 10 by 10 meter scale. Good. So dealing with roughness is not solved yet. And probably the best we can do at the moment is really dealing with uncertainties, but the uncertainties will be huge. Good. The second thing is how much may retention and run on infiltration may be a problem. Retention is clear. We may have a small uh, area where water is filling up. Uh, run on infiltration, you may not be so aware, is more or less a process where runoff may, may or overland flow may occur at one location. It flows down, it flows to an area that where still water can infiltrate in the soil, and that water may infiltrate in addition, and hence being retained in the uh, catchment. As an example, I just show you the same catchment as before, that is the wheat carbon, where we have quite a mixture of uh, grassland and pasture. And we were running three types of models, always a 100-year precipitation event with a 60-minute duration. And one model is just running a two-dimensional hydraulic uh, without any possibility of reinfiltration, and the other is more as direct combination of the Roger model with a two dynamic hydraulic model, considering all possible effects of one on infiltration. Good. So, what you see here, maybe we just concentrate to the two white pictures, is uh, the flooding. Or the average, in that case, compare the average water level that the two models are producing. Here in the middle, the model without any one on infiltration, and on the left, the model with one on infiltration. Exactly the same soil condition, exactly the same uh, precipitation condition. But we clearly see here we may have overland flow appearing at certain locations, but that water is just able to infiltrate. And hence, for example, in that forest catchment up here, all the runoff from the forest roads are just infiltrating again in, on the, in, in, the, in, the, in the hill slopes uh, further downhill, and the water will not be able more or less to run down to the stream. This is not the case if you do not consider runoff infiltration, right? Here the water is just accumulating and producing areas with quite a bit of uh, water or quite a bit of flooding in that upper area. We see other uh, effects here and down here, right? So we have just those effects of uh, run-on infiltration. We have also effects then certainly on the maximal velocity because this depends then on the water level. And if you do a comparison, just the difference in infiltration that we simulated with our simple model and the the combined model, we see more or less three types how, how important one on infiltration can be. First, down here, areas where we have water accumulating and 
water, you see here the accumulation of the water from that field may further infiltrate in that lower laying areas at the slope of the Hitler. The second may be areas where land use or soils are just changing. So we see, for example, here water is flowing down and hits here different land use where we have a different infiltration possibility. Hence, we have higher infiltration here or here, right? So the local setup or the local situation of the land use and the soil pattern has a lot of effects and may hence, in, may hence influence the infiltration. And the third one would be sinks or uh, areas where water can stand for a longer time and just infiltrate slowly in the soil. Now, the effect on the runoff is quite large. So here on the left side, you see the runoff response at the, at the outlet. The black curve shows you the runoff response without considering reinfiltration or runoff infiltration. The gray line, the hydrograph, with considering runoff infiltration. And you see it's not only that the runoff amount is quite different. So here we have a total amount of 10 millimeters. Here we only have a total amount of six millimeters, but mostly the peak and the time to peak changes quite a bit. Here we have a peak runoff of seven cubic meter per second, and we, here we are at 3.5 cubic meter per second, right? So just by considering that additional process, we strongly change the effect of peak flow and the timing of the runoff response. Good. Uh, my last point goes towards if you have so many possibilities considering those different processes, different uh, assumption in, uh, uh, in hydraulic uh, models, we need some kind of benchmarking. And one example I, I would like to show you is an example from Luxembourg, where we were running the model at a location where a big thunderstorm was uh, occurring over a small catchment. And that catchment, the Scherbach, uh, is a catchment that looks a little bit strange, right? It has a very large uh, plateau and then a very strong incision. Uh, into that uh, creek, and there is a small city located here. So all the water that's accumulating in that Scherbach has to run through that city. And uh, during that event in 2016, there was quite a bit of flooding. And the first hydraulic model we were running was not considering one-on infiltration. And we estimated at that location where we had that nice picture here, we estimated a peak runoff of uh, 4.5 cubic meter a second and calculated uh, water depths between uh, 1 to 1 meter 50. However, the location here was only a maximum water table depth or water depth of 30 centimeters. So we are really off. If we are considering the effect of uh, reinfiltration, we get a completely different hydrograph, uh, only up to 300 liters per second. And you actually again see it here that a lot of the water is actually being generated on those agricultural lands on the plateau, starts to run off, hits the forest on those deeper slopes, and can re infiltrate. And only as at a small location, the water is able to get down to the stream and be able to flood the city. And if you then do the same calculation for that location, the model produces a water table, a water depth between uh, 24 to 30 centimeters, which is very close to the estimated 30 centimeters that, we, that was observed during that uh, event. So the city actually can be happy that they have those forested slopes, right? Because if I think those slopes would not be forested. They actually would have had a much higher uh, runoff and a much higher discharge 
moving through the whole city. Good. And now, my outlook. I think that models that are based on the relevant infiltration processes can really help to make those predictions. But even then, parametrization is still the main problem. At the moment, our models are just being parameterized based on the information we can regain. So we are not calibrating our models. We are just validating the models uh, in the location where we have data. And certainly, sometimes we are off. And then we have to think why we are off. And I think this is important to think why you are off and why is your model that you are not calibrating is not producing the right result. We hope that considering the combined probability of initial conditions and rainfall characteristic is a good way to more or less make prediction in those small catchments because we do not have any discharge measurements. Hence, we cannot go with a typical uh, approach having a long term of discharge measurements during our flood statistic and making predictions for one and a year flood. And we hope that this approach may help in doing so. And the third point is, if we use a hydrological model to drive, to push a hydraulic model for predicting flash flood maps, um, first of all, we really have to think hard how that hydraulic model is really working, how the roughness is being included, are the model assumptions really correct? And secondly, there may be many catchments where run-on infiltration can strongly alter the hydrograph, and hence the maps of flooding may be very off if you do not include those run-on run -on infiltration. So thank you for your attention, and yeah, 45 minutes, not so bad. All right. Well, thank you very much, Marcus. We have some time for questions. And uh, as usual, if you can put them into the chat and I'll look for them. And if I miss them, Kim, you'll, uh, you will ask or, or send them to me, whatever might work. So as we await uh, questions, Marcus, I guess uh, I, I keep thinking about soil depth. For instance, in the example you gave from Luxembourg at the end with uh, with run on, how do you deal with the size, the amount of storage, and and potentially filling that storage during a unusually high magnitude event, and how that you know plays into the runoff generation that you're describing? Mm -hmm. So should I keep should I stop sharing the screen? Is that or what do you want actually? Uh, I don't think it's a problem either way. Don, okay. I have a... Uh, yeah, I keep that around. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, uh, certainly we need to consider depth because as you mentioned, right, it really gives us the total storage we have for certain additional soil moisture condition. And as you all know, uh, the soil depths may not be always be very well captured because most of our um, soil maps uh, or the people who derive those soil maps usually stop at one meter depth when they try, when they start mapping soils, but they may have soils that are much deeper. So uh, we use more or less the uh, provided soil maps that are very, I think, quite good in Baden-Württemberg. They had a scale of one to fifty thousand, uh, uh, one to twenty-five thousand. Uh, and uh, soil depth is, is also an information in those, and we directly include the soil depths in our model. And if you have shallow soils, it may happen, as you point out as well, we also consider, consider initial groundwater table depths, that soils may become saturated and produce overland flow due to saturation. However, this is mostly the case moving towards a little bit the longer events, right? usually not the 15 or 30 minutes events, because the intensity there is so high that it's really mostly hot only in our view. But correctly, if soils are very shallow or if we have longer events, and that is what I was mentioning before, that some of the catchments are more responsive 
for the longer events. And the, 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 more, the, higher, the, the largest reason is either the groundwater table is very shallow uh, or the depth of the groundwater table is very shallow or that the uh, soil depth is relatively small. There was a question that came in. Oh, sorry, Kim, is that you there? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say we've got a couple of questions here. Yeah. Okay, so uh, go ahead, Jeff. No, you go, go ahead, Kim. Okay, so there's two questions here uh, from Vimal Marcus. How are you defining an event in the context of rainfall? And then I'm going to add a second part to that. And on what basis can we say an event is heavy? Sure, that's very subjective. So for, for us, uh, it, it, we have to, we, let's put it like this. So we have to certainly look at two different conditions. One is what we do in really making those assumptions, making a prediction for an event with a certain return period. Right? In doing those, we can really play around. We can consider 30 minutes, one hour, two hour, one day events, right? And there we just do the typical statistics based on our long-term rainfall records with a high temporal resolution where we have rainfall measurements every one minute or every five minutes. And then we can do the maximum uh, rainfall depths for a certain duration and come up with the statistics and derive a 100 year event or so. If you have an observed rainfall event or an observed uh, event, let's put it like this, right? There it's already difficult, more difficult, right? Because usually the observed event, it has a certain pattern of rainfall intensity. And it may happen that we observe an event that for five minute duration, the maximum intensity may be uh, similar to a 10 year event. But if you look at the 30 minute uh, duration, it may be up to a 60 uh, uh, year event, right? So that is always that problem in what we do for those simple analysis, considering just fixed durations, and how we can then bring that back to the natural observed variability of rainfall intensities during an event. Yeah. Um, that word heavy is more as just the definition that most of the Met offices define <laughs> for, uh, for rainfall. Marcus, here's a question about your rainfall sprinkler uh, experiment. Is that focused strictly on overland flow in terms of how much uh, goes in versus how much runs off? Or are you looking at other aspects of flow in those hill slope scale one week uh, sprinkler experiments you described at the beginning? So the focus was overland flow, right? So this was the main reason why we did the experiment. But we also made a small trench, not a really deep one, only to 70 centimeters. And we also collected the subsurface flow in those trenches or in that trench with all the problems we have that you may know of not having the whole hill slope sprinkled, et cetera. Uh, and we did a lot of other measurements. So uh, we put in uh, piezometers so we could measure the water table response in the soil. Right? If you have a saturated wedge, or saturated area in the soil. Uh, we put in a lot of uh, soil moisture sensors in order to look at the infiltration patterns and the initial water content and the how the, uh, the uh, soil moisture is changing. We measured additionally uh, uh, climatic meteorological condition. We put a lot of effort in describing the soils, et cetera, et cetera. So at the end, I think for those different events, we have and the, all the data is in that data paper I just presented. We have more or less continuous data on soil moisture, on uh, water table depths or water table and overland flow and some sort of flow. So it could certainly also be used for other models yeah. or for other questions. Yep. Here's ah, question. sorry, and, and we measured, sorry, I forgot. Uh, and we also measured uh, erosion, so we also measured uh, Okay. The uh, turbidity, and we also measured uh, the particulate and the dissolved um, elements that we found in the water. Great. Thank you.
Here's a question from Mohammed. Uh, as you mentioned, 30 minute precipitation leads to max runoff coefficient. What would happen for the rest of the water with 240 minutes of precipitation? I mean, infiltration plays a key role or are there other factors? Uh, for that catchment, maybe we can just go back. So it's maybe easier to describe that. Or probably you refer to this one. Um, it's just here that combination of that duration and hence that rainfall amount and intensity for that catchment, right? That really produces then the highest runfall uh, uh, runoff amount, right? Uh, if rainfall duration becomes lower, intensity gets lower, and hence for that catchment, more water could infiltrate in total, hence less overland flow is being generated. And as I'm saying, that picture looks always different. It's like a fingerprint for every catchment. If we do that, I looked at those for quite a bit of different catchments, and uh, you, you cannot backtrace it to what's happening in detail, right? Because it combines all the information we have about macropores, soils, uh, geology, surface ceiling, vegetation, that's all combined in the model, and it just makes up out of that uh, mix then the runoff response, right? So some uh, some uh, catchments you can probably say, yeah, and here it will probably happen like this, but it's always not so straightforward as you might think in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But I guess, what about rain on snow? I guess you're mm -hmm. you're not in a cold enough environment for that to be the perfect storm of conditions. Think back to the Oregon days or either Southern British Columbia, you know, rain on snow is, is the uh, condition for the biggest events. Uh, yeah. This, I, I guess, so what you're describing and this kind of analysis is very uh, place based in that way. Yeah, so it, it, there are also many catchments who are very prone to rain on snow in, in Germany. But the response or the flooding there is typical for those fluvial floods. So it will be then the larger catchments of several hundred square kilometer who then may be flooded to those rain on snow events. And then all mostly in the winter time suddenly or uh, not in the summer. So the analysis, the focus we did in this study was only considering summer because we know thunderstorms are just happening 99% only during the summer season, no winter season, yeah. and the rainfall intensities are just not high enough in the winter. But okay. only those high rainfall intensities are prone then to the flooding in those very small catchments, right? Because for the long events, they, ease, they, they can easily drain the water, right? There's, that's no problem for them, right? Uh, and, but then there's a problem for the larger catchments where we have large scale runoff production from the rain on snow events or from the long lasting rainfall events, where then adding up those water would produce the largest floods in the larger uh, rivers. Right. Okay, thank you very much, Marcus. We're at the top of the hour. We need to close and uh, get you to the next event. But on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for a really uh, interesting seminar and uh, insights into what you're doing in hill slope hydrology and modeling. Thanks so much.